Um, hello, uh, thank you for being here. My name is, uh, as I like to introduce myself, Ben like Ben Franklin. Uh, I'd like to first thank the Ancestral Health Society for giving me this opportunity to speak uh, uh, here at the symposium. Um, yeah, so uh, nobody really wants to hear a lawyer talk that much or that long. Um, so I'm going to try to make this short and sweet, and no pun intended. Um, all right, so uh, warning labels on sugar. Let me, uh, oh, let's see if this is advancing. Ah, here we go. Uh, so lawyers are all about the fine print, so we're going to start with that. Uh, the disclaimer is that I don't claim copyright to, uh, for some photos. It's very important that I say that because I'm an IP attorney. <laughs> uh, um, the no client attorney relationship is formed by this presentation and then use this information at your own risk. Uh, uh, the attorney cannot predict or guarantee results. Uh, by, uh, if anybody is going to take photos, by the way, that uh, I would love it if you could share it with me um, through social media or just tag me or something, uh, I would be very appreciative. Um, and then a, some disclosures that I have is that I have uh, clients in this nutrition field, and then I have uh, uh, an opportunity to work on Prop 65 defensive litigation on behalf of actually a furniture manufacturer um, whose product contained a flame retardant as a listed chemical. So then that's kind of part of the qualification of me being able to speak with you on this subject. Okay, um, the title of this talk is called Warning Labels on Sugar. Before we slap a single warning label on anything that's sweet, we need to understand what a warning looks like. Okay, so here's a couple of examples. This is a warning from the happiest place on earth, which apparently contains chemicals known to the state of California to cause cancer, birth defects, um, or other reproductive harm. Sounds very, very happy to me. Um, here's a photo that I snapped at Starbucks. You can see this at every single Starbucks, uh, you know, for uh, uh, apparently the coffee there uh, might give you cancer. And then uh, here's another one. Uh, trees in California will also give you cancer. <laughs> so they're, they're really kind of all over. Is anybody here not from California? Oh, quite a few. Welcome to California. <laughs> so it's a little nutty. Um, all right, so what is the law behind all these warnings, right? Uh, it's a law called Proposition 65. Um, the official title is the Safe Drinking Water and Toxic Enforcement Act of 1986. Uh, but since it was a voter initiative statute, which is something that made it, you know, in, into, uh, it was a proposition that voters voted on and became a state law, uh, it, uh, you know, we call it Prop 65 by the number that it was uh, proposed uh, onto the ballot. Um, it requires businesses to provide warnings to Californians about significant exposures to chemicals that cause cancer, birth defects, or other reproductive harm. Um, there's these underlying terms because they're particularly important. They're, they're legal terms of art. Uh, and in um, one of the most important terms here is cause, and then we'll go over that in just a little bit. Uh, other provisions of the law, it prohibits businesses in California from knowingly discharging uh, listed chemicals into uh, drinking water. Um, and it requires the state government to publish a list of chemicals. Okay, that's also going to be important, what chemicals make it onto the list uh, to cause all these issues. Okay, um, so these, regarding these legal terms of art, uh, you have cause, or as we know in tort law, it is called causation, okay? And this is really important because it establishes respons responsibility. In order to be liable in a tort, you have to actually cause the tort. Um, and so this, this is uh, not unique to this law. It's kind of unique to all the common law that's ever been in tort. So uh, the best example that I like to give, everybody likes to give is a like car accident. Uh, if, you, if you were speeding, you caused that accident. Uh, you, you hit somebody, you caused that accident. Um, if you smoke and there's tobacco smoke and it caused cancer, then there's causation. Um, now, causation itself um, does not have to be A to B. It could actually be chained. So then if, for example, car A hits car B and car B loses control, it hits pedestrian C, then A would have caused the injuries to pedestrian C as uh, from A to B to C. It's like a chain of causation. Um, another legal term of art that we should pay attention to is the list of chemicals that I mentioned. They generally need to be chemical compounds with cast numbers and things like that. Uh, we see that a lot of like organic chemicals and contaminants, you know, things like pesticides, additives, you know, they tend to make the list, to, they populate most of the list uh, in California. 
but also uh, more general stuff like tobacco smoke. Tobacco smoke is listed as a chemical. I mean, we could kind of say that, okay, it sort of is, isn't, you know, it's a kind of a quirk in the, the grand uh, regulatory scheme. So uh, before I go too deep into this slide, I just have this big caveat. Um, I think everybody in here, almost everybody here will know more about the actual research for all of this stuff more than I do. Because I, this is my day job as a lawyer, it's not a researcher, <laughs> I mean, I'm not a scientist. So this is based on my understanding of kind of like being a layperson, uh, looking at the research in, for somebody who's involved in this field for a number of years. So uh, here we go, that's my big caveat. Uh, I believe sugar is carcinogenic because sugar uh, causes insulin resistance, which then contributes to obesity, which then is a risk factor for cancer. Uh, in terms of reproductive harm, uh, there's also a case for that because insulin resistance we know is linked with uh, uh, PCOS, uh, uh, polycystic uh, ovarian syndrome. Um, and then also uh, insulin resistance to obesity, uh, which is a big risk factor for autism. One of the most significant risk factors for autism is the obesity of the mother. Um, so you can, you probably already have a question here, uh, which is, you know, you, you, we have a chain of causation, right? Uh, all these things are in a chain. And what happens when you link causation in a chain? Um, every single link in the chain of causation uh, is subject or vulnerable to attack by somebody who is defending, right? Like say you say you're suing some person in a potential lawsuit, and they're like, okay, well then maybe we can't establish this, this particular link between insulin, between IR and obesity, or obesity to here, you know? And then, so therefore we could say that the entire chain doesn't, is, is faulty and that we're not liable. And you, know, you can expect very, very vigorous uh, legal defenses uh, based on that. So wouldn't it be nice if we just had sugar that went straight to all this stuff, all the cancer birth defects and, and all that? Wouldn't it be nice, right? And you know, honestly, when I was putting this together, I was thinking to myself that uh, you know, there's there's no such paper. I couldn't find anything, and then so I'm gonna be up here blowing smoke. But hey, guess what? I got really lucky. Um, not that lucky, actually. This was uh, all over the news. It was a, a study in the BMJ, published in the BMJ, actually just very recently. It was uh, May 7th of this year. Um, is the sugary drinks cancer study? Uh, this was headline on CNN.com for something like 12 hours before it disappeared because it was probably in line with the uh, profit motives of exactly zero people. Um, didn't make anybody any money. Uh, the, uh, the facts here are that a 100 milliliter per day consumption of sugary drinks contributed to an 18% increased risk in relative risk in overall cancer. 22% uh, increase in relative risk of breast cancer. And then if, you, if that form of sugar was fruit juice, then there was a 12% increase in relative risk. Um, I thought something that was really impressive was that they really tried to get, uh, get rid of the, a lot of the, the uh, confounding factors, which was uh, they looked at uh, consumption of artificially sweetened beverages and they found no link between if you drank fake sugar and cancer. Um, and also they controlled for a bunch of, bunch of other stuff. Uh, one of the most significant things was BMI. So you could actually say that from this study, not only does this study prove that link, that sugar contributed to all the, uh, that sugar contributed to cancer, you could also say that obesity itself was not independently relevant or that no, no link was found. They were able to control for that as, as a risk factor independent of the sugar. Uh, another way to say that is just simply that you, were, you had an increased chance of getting cancer regardless of how fat you are. That's colloquial. Um, and when you, when you think about this, you know, like 18%, uh, you might already be asking the question, 18%, isn't that just like the, uh, the red meat study uh, with the colorectal cancer? Wasn't that all, almost also 18% and it's like enough to give me PTSD just thinking about 18% all day? Uh, <laughs> you know, but uh, the... Um, I think it's significant for a number of reasons, especially because it was only 100 milliliters of sugary drinks per day, okay? Uh, this uh, is really only uh, 11 grams of sugar. Uh, it, it said in the paper, it, it, sorry, it wasn't in this results. And uh, it's only a third of a can of Coke. Now, you guys all have met people who eat or drink a lot of junk food. Um, nobody drinks a third of a can of Coke. 
they're probably knocking down two or three a day. So they're, they're probably like easily doubling their risk or, or tripling their risk. You know, it's probably way more than 80% if this ends up being linearly extrapolatable. Um, so I got really lucky I found this uh, uh, particular paper. And I'm sure that as more research uh, is done, there's probably going to be more. So uh, adding chemicals to the list. Um, there are four ways to do this. Uh, it's basically that you need to be identified by another credible institution. Uh, one of them is the International Agency for Research on Cancer. Uh, it's a, uh, a sub-organization of the World Health Organization. Uh, and then it could get in that way. It could get in through uh, recon uh, being recognized by all these other federal agencies, the Environmental Protection Agency, Food and Drug Administration, OSHA. Uh, so on and so forth. And then also another way that prescription drugs get to be added um, because prescription drugs can have a lot of side effects, which may include cancer. Um, but the thing that we're going to talk about and is the most relevant to citizen input and you know, just public action in general is the state qualified expert, uh, experts comprising of two committees. Okay, I'm going to go on to this next slide. This is administered by an office in California called the Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment, is OEHA. Uh, they administered two committees. One of them is the uh, Carcinogen Identification Committee, uh, and the other one is the Developmental Reproductive Tox Toxicant Identification. This is DARTIC. Uh, and as you can see, the Prop 65, you remember it was, the, uh, it was uh, causing cancer and causing reproductive harm, right? There were two different things. So one committee does the cancer thing, and the other one does the reproductive harm thing. But you can see that there are a group of expert scientists appointed by the governor to identify chemicals that are clearly shown through scientific valid testing according to generally accepted principles to cause cancer. So you really needed to be legit in the way that they determined this. Um, my next question was doing, when doing all this research, or who are all these committee, uh, committee members, right? And I found out that they're, they're actually generally people who are fairly credible. They're doctors, they're professors, they're researchers. Uh, surprisingly, not that many political appointees. I thought it was going to be all political appointees or partisan hacks, and I didn't find any people who were in that category. So it was pretty impressive the way that this was being run. A um, couple of uh, more notable. Uh, citations uh, the, uh, in the law is that uh, uh, they're really, really required to get public input. Science scientists from the OEWHA prepare a hazard identification document contains the scientific evidence. The public has an opportunity to submit relevant information to the office that may be included in the document, right? Um, it's also that even, even the public is very strongly recommended to do so, you know, to rec encourage to prepare written comments if they wish to have a scientific issue uh, considered by the committees. Um, so this is a, a, a great opportunity for people to comment, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. The legal standard here is that it needs to be, as we mentioned, clearly shown through scientific valid testing according to generally accepted principles to cause cancer or other harm. Um, and they also consider all these other things. In addition to scientific valid testing, they consider fact finding in court decisions. So if there has been a lawsuit on that chemical in the past where the court has made certain findings, it will usually make it into the report. Uh, scientific peer review, they look at a lot of like different articles. Uh, and also, importantly, public comments by individuals, the organizations and businesses uh, that have a stake. Um, so some of the more famous uh, chemicals that have made it onto the list in California, this is the most recent one. This one was actually a, a bit of a headache for uh, one client of mine. Um, they were uh, wondering about whether they needed a label on their coffee. And it was a question bugging uh, people who sold coffee in California. Uh, it, it was, uh, they were trying to decide whether to label cancer-causing chemicals in coffee. Uh, they decided against this, uh, and this decision is very, very recent, June 7th of this year, 166-page uh, fact-finding report stating reasons against warning labels. You know, uh, you know th there was a, a ton of uh, public comment, uh, you know, saying that you know coffee, uh, you know, shouldn't be labeled, and then uh, a lot of findings uh, that coffee contained beneficial chemicals that actually, um, you know, uh, uh, prevented cancer uh, was was part of the finding. Um, the reason for this was because of the chemical acrylamide. Uh, you might all be familiar with this, but acrylamide is a chemical that is 
formed by burning uh, food, essentially, like starches that if you subject it into high heat and then you, they, they were, you know, they were charred. Uh, that acrylamide was formed, and acrylamide itself was found to have caused cancer. It wasn't even controversial in 1990. It just made it straight onto the list. Um, and in fact, that uh, the there's been a lot of enforcement action against actual acrylamide. There is a, a court case by the attorney general's office against a uh, you know Frito Lay, uh, other potato chip makers to either get their act together, cut acrylamide levels, or get a warning label. Either you cut your levels and pay the fine or you got a warning label. Well, guess what? They decided to consent degree, cut their levels. Uh, this was a, an actual really significant success of the law, right? It resulted in an actual reduction of exposure to toxic chemicals to the public. Yeah, like, like you know, that, that we're, it's because of this court case and this law that we're all eating less acrylamide um, uh, in general. Um, and then there's also many other lawsuits that resulted in a similar reduction, you know, that manufacturers, when faced with a lawsuit, faced with the fact that they had to put warning labels on everything, decided that they were going to clean up their act. Um, other famous chemicals, uh, alcoholic beverages, you know, yeah, no-brainer, tobacco smoke, um, you know, they're all listed fairly early in the regulatory scheme. Glyphosate, uh, fairly recent, 2017. Um, this was very contentious. It generated an astounding 1,310 public comments during the hearing process. You know, so many people uh, 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 commented on glyphosate, and it was finally listed uh, 2017. But in very high concentrations, that, that kind of permissible uh, 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 recognized safe level was something like 1,500 micrograms per person per day, um, which is really how, which is why you don't see more glyphosate labels on all the stuff that contain, you know, wheat or soy uh, is because those products don't contain it in that particular concentration uh, that would make it significant uh, under Prop 65. Um, so why is all this important, right? What, what has Prop 65 uh, done or what has it not done? Uh, policy ramifications. Um, you may have heard the saying, as California goes, uh, uh, so goes the nation. Um, one of the things that we see is, is that you may have seen cars that have 50 state emissions uh, on there. Like you can buy a car that has uh, emission, uh, an emission level that's acceptable to all 50 states in the country. Well, it doesn't mean that the car automatically knows how much it pollutes you know, when you drive it across a state line. It doesn't know what, what, where it is. It's just that it simply meets the most stringent standard, which is California. Um, and the reason for, for this is because it's really expensive for manufacturers to make different versions of their products to comply with each state's uh, uh, requirements. So they just make it comply with the most stringent one. Uh, there's uh, a lot of container traffic that passed through West Coast ports. 73% uh, of it passed just to the north of us in the ports of uh, LA and Long Beach, which are right next to each other. Uh, it accounts for 32% of the U.S. shipping total for container traffic. So basically, as soon as uh, these containers land in California, they're subject to Prop 65. And, you know, there's really even no debate. You know, it's like, why, why even bother? Just make it compliant. Um, here is a warning sticker for uh, uh, Prop 65. You can buy these, uh, five, 500 on these, 500 in a roll. Sticking on our product is for the low, low price of seven, uh, 13 79 uh, free shipping. Um, this is a, uh, uh, it comes, it kind of comes out to like 2.3 cents or 2.7 cents per label. Very, very cheap. Um, and part of this is because it's frivolous litigation, right? And then I put frivolous in quotes because depending on your perspective, for litigation may or may not be frivolous. If you're a manufacturer, anybody who sues you and says that they've been hurt by your product is automatically fr frivolous. You know, they're a pain in the butt, get into your way of your profits. Uh, if you're somebody who's been hurt by that product, uh, then well, maybe not, right? Maybe your litigation's mer very uh, meritorious. Um, they're private litigants, uh, people in the public can sue under Prop 65. So it doesn't have to be the attorney general that enforces, it could be um, private litigants. And so there's been a few law firms, you know, and this is, people kind of trot this out as examples. They base their entire business model under Prop 65. There's like five law firms in California that only do Prop 65 litigation. Um, you know, they're, they're on Berkeley um, figures. Uh, and uh, they're, um, a lot of businesses are ju ju just so scared of being sued that they just throw, slap, you know, warning labels every, everywhere. You know, a lot of times it's, it's 
impossible for them to exhaustively test the products come from overseas. Who knows what that, what that factory was making before the factory retooled to make their product. There might be residues and, and stuff like that. It's just way cheaper to warrant than to test for a lot of manufacturers. So which is why you see these warnings everywhere, including on possibly trees, right? And then also uh, warning label issues, you know, uh, it, it, you, you just, this is a, uh, uh, a Christmas tree light set, and the one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, does anybody actually read all that when you buy a Christmas light? You go home, you plug it in. Anybody actually read all that? No? <laughs> I, I always wish there was one person to raise their hand and I can make fun of them. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so um, th this is just the situation where there's just too many warnings. You know, they're nonspecific. Our primal brains are not adapted for these, you know, uh, oh, some chemical, some product, some, some, something dangerous, you know, what, like, what, what do I do with this, right? Why are you selling this to me? And so they're, they're just, most people end up ignoring them is, is what's going on. It's kind of the boy that cries wolf, and that's uh, definitely a problem. So uh, why should we care, right? Why, why is this important? If the warnings are, are just nonspecific and, and, you know, we can't act on them, uh, why should we care? Um, I hate to be the proverbial canary in the carnivore meetup, but the vegans are coming. The vegans are coming. Um, this is a uh, resolution uh, that uh, was proposed in the, in the California legislature. This was right after the 18% colorectal cancer red meat study came out that uh, uh, it, this was sponsored uh, to try to add processed meat to Prop 65 as a chemical. Uh, and you would imagine that the office of uh, the OEWHA would be very, very persuaded if the California legislature instructed them to look at red meat, uh, to look at red meat as a, a potential carcinogen, right? Um, who, did, who did this? Backed by the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. Anybody know that, know those guys? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, Dana Rogers here Thursday morning. Uh, I was the session chair. Yeah, we went off on that. Uh, and then apparently they added their name. It's called like, and they added them social compassion in legislation. Um, yeah, this is too long. I just call them the uh, uh, physician committee uh, for fluffy animals. Um. <laughs> fluffy animals is, is essentially what it is. Uh, it, it, it is actually a PETA front group. Um, uh, they, they share funding and they share some board members. And uh, these guys were notorious for leaking Dr. Atkins medical records to the Wall Street Journal saying that he died of a heart attack. So they were really at war with the whole, you know, Atkins. They don't like low carvers. <laughs> they were at war with this, you know, long before probably any of us were really uh, uh, into this. Um, this photo right here kind of just sends shivers up my spine. You know, anybody remember that Time Magazine cover where there was like a doctor, certain doctor who wasn't a doctor, wore a white coat and told Americans to eat less cholesterol? Yeah, that guy. Um, you know, it, it's as if Ansel Keys uh, asexually re reproduced and made 300 copies of himself. <laughs> it's like, this, this is the photo right here. <laughs> um, yeah, so yeah, all these white coats, right? You know, like you're supposed to be persuasive. Uh, they're really on the warpath. They're, they're really everywhere. Um, uh, I was able to find this. This was, again, in the California Assembly, incentivizing plant-based meals in public schools. There was a city council resolution uh, that failed in LA. They were going to mandate that every restaurant that did business with the city of LA have offer at least one vegetarian option, right? Um, this kind of screws small people. Uh, it, it doesn't affect the big chains. The big chains can make cha you know, the changes fairly easily. They have the resources, they have the marketing. Uh, a lot of them are doing it right now because it's like good press. But it, this is gonna really be very, very tough on the smaller players, the people who don't have a choice, the mom and pop, maybe we're thinking like the ramen store that, you know, restaurant that only has like one type of bone broth and they have to make something that's completely vegetarian or vegan based on these regulations, which would really, really clearly be very onerous to them. Uh, they, they really are. Uh, they're, they're making changes, whether we do anything or not, they're already pushing for this to, to happen. Um, so what can we do, right? Um, there are a few organizations that uh, uh, are pushing back. Uh, the, the one that comes to mind is the Nutrition Coalition is run by uh, Nina Teicholz. Uh, she's um, uh, conducting uh, uh, some, a lot of lobbying, uh, uh, you know, like at the USDA front with the dietary guidelines. You know, they're tr she's trying to go ahead and uh, uh, get some common sense back into the guidelines. 
Uh, another thing that is really, really relevant to the whole uh, office of uh, this OEWHA uh, committee is that you know we should assemble a, a library of helpful research, uh, starting with that sugar study, right? I'm sure there's, there's other ones. There are things that we've heard really, really exciting at this conference. Uh, Rob, uh, Rob Abbott, uh, you know, with his uh, uh, you know, crowdfunded research you know, um, on hypothyroidism, and then you know, the thing that he's doing with Lucy Mailing uh, next year. Um, a few, other, a few other people, this, this kind of like ground up research that we are doing, we have to do it because nobody else is gonna do it. It's not in line with anybody else's profit motives, right? Except for the people who are actually suffering from it uh, is the dietary and lifestyle changes actually uh, uh, you know, gonna be helpful. If we have research, then oops, uh, then we can um, go ahead and uh, uh, try to effect some changes through letters and petitions. Uh, uh, you know, organizations to uh, send up to the committees. They have to, by law, consider our comments. They have to respond to each and every single one. So you can imagine that glyphosate report, uh, uh, 1,310 public comments, you know, and the response, that the, uh, the uh, record of facts and stuff, that, that was a labor of love for, the, <laughs> for, for these government bureaucrats. Um, so they, they really do have to pay attention to us, is the idea. And also, uh, uh, encourage and support litigation. I was not able to find a better way of saying this, but what I kind of had in mind was uh, with the McDonald's um, hot coffee case. The one where uh, it was, the coffee was too hot and it spilled on somebody and then they got sued, right? Uh, that kind of went around the internet uh, and then you know, was made uh, you know, the butt of jokes you know, for you know, probably like years it, it went around. But when you think about it, Court cases are are vetted, um, are vetted very stringently uh, by judges. Uh, judges don't want bad press, uh, and opposing counsel, right? You know, so they they have to constantly survive these motions, these motions to dismiss, you know, failure to state a claim, uh, uh, so motions for summary judgment, all all these like different motions uh, in order for the lawsuit to proceed. For in order for that lawsuit to actually gotten to the jury, and then for that. The, uh, the, the plaintiff to actually receive damages, the, the case must have been fairly credible, is what I'm trying to say. So, you know, next time you see some, uh, uh, the article that says, hey, look, there's this crazy court case, you know, uh, before you hit uh, share and have a good laugh with your friends, you know, maybe uh, see if, you know, maybe the, maybe the coffee was really too hot. Maybe it was poured in a container that didn't, that, that couldn't withstand that temperature of coffee. And then maybe that coffee went you know, straight down, and then somebody got skin grafts and really had damages, right? Um, which was the, the truth with the, that particular lawsuit. Um, and so in conclusion, uh, I wanted to mention a, a, a few things that I've observed uh, now that I'm, you know, six years in with this community. Uh, I feel like everything in the last uh, few years have been framed in this kind of like right or left, you know, liberal or conservative, uh, Republican or Democrat. Um, you know, and one of the things that had fallen victim to that is food choice. Um, I understand that because politics are as old as human civilization. But you know what's older is actually basic facts about the human body and biology, right? A million years old. The body is going to do what it's evolutionarily programmed to do, regardless of how we try to frame it. Uh, and biology is really nonpartisan. Uh, there are facts here that are going to help us win the argument. Um, and I believe that it is our job to leverage those facts uh, so that we can win this fight. And I am done, right on time. Thank you very much. So if anybody's got questions, Ben charges by the minute or the question. I'm not sure how this works. <laughs> Billable hours will apply. I've got a question It's free here. for the 10 minutes. I got a question, and since I have a microphone and y'all haven't cut me off yet, I'm going to ask it. Um, is there any consideration of multiple causalities? So something that may be uh, duplicitously causal. So this plus this plus this, where there mm -hmm. is an implication that multiple factors are involved. Right, right, in yeah, com confounding factors. Absolutely, that would factor into court law. That's a common defense, is to say that your cancer was caused by something else you did. Um, it, it requires a, a careful vetting at the court case stage. As I said, the cases are all fairly carefully vetted. Uh, you know, they're dismissed really early if it's something doesn't make sense. Uh, it is kind of like the, the job of the attorney to really prep their, their client, their, the plaintiff, 
to make sure that they they really have eliminated all the other uh, other factors. Right. Thank you. Very interesting talk. Thanks for laying it all out there for us. Thanks yeah. for coming. Yeah. So um, I've got two, maybe three questions. One is on that s study that you found connecting sugary drinks to cancer, right, where you got the 18% mm -hmm. uptick. Over what period of time was that study? Was that a short-term study? Because sometimes cancer takes a while to develop, right? Or was that uh, an epid? I mean, I, what was the methodology <clears throat> there? Uh, it, the epidemiology uh, was epidemiological, but it yeah. was from a French, uh, large French nutritional study. They didn't just study uh, this particular outcome. It was a nutritional survey that was sent out to over 100,000 people and followed for an average of five years. Uh, so then they would- Survey-based. Yeah, okay. it was survey-based. But then what they did was they sent out a survey for, um, uh, for over a two-week period. They sent out three surveys to a random participant uh, for a two, random two-week period, mm -hmm. and they, they did this repeatedly uh, throughout the year, so they got a relatively good sampling of the particular uh, population at any given time. But it's still then observational, not causal, right? It's observational, yes, right. but it was over a two-week period. Two period. I, I have reasons to think it's reliable um, right. because it, it was, you know, very recent in memory. It's what did you eat on this day, uh, you know, like two days ago or three days ago or something like that. Yeah. So, so. And then they back it out, they um, sort of make an estimate. Right, I believe yeah. the question took the form of what did you eat on this day? Yeah. Um, and then they collected everything, and then it was very recent, like, like that questionnaire went out like three days after, or four, four days after, mm -hmm. or something. And then they got sent three questionnaires uh, over a span of two weeks. Like you just knew that when you agreed to participate in the study, that right. you had to do the, you okay. had to do this like for every okay. two weeks. For, so I yeah. guess that leads to my next question, which is, all right, observational. Um, you're not looking at something that is a carcinogen in really low dose where you can really see strong effect, you know, something that's just a real mm -hmm. carcinogen. But sugar is something that, yeah, it, on average it might cause this effect mm -hmm. in, a, in the whole population. But then for a, s subsets that use sugar you know, responsibly or whatever, mm -hmm. it's no big deal, right? It's, it's fine. You know, I have sugar and mm -hmm. not too right. much. Right, yeah, like, so what if we get a warning label, right, on yeah, sugar yeah. Is, is, is the question. Yeah. So that's, so on uh -huh. the flip, I mean, if you kind of go with that, then it opens you up on the meat thing. And I guess I'm concerned with going away from very, very strict, you know, dose-dependent kind of studies to more uh, essentially milking the data mm -hmm. to get a trend on a whole population and not looking at the fact that a single compound, sugar, meat, can be beneficial or not when put in in context with everything else, unlike carcinogens. So what, mm -hmm. what's your thought on that? Um, my thought on that is that, uh, uh, as I've said, if we don't do it, the vegans are doing it. So this is independently happening uh, to me, regardless of whether we do anything here or not. And it's been shown in litigation that this has actually caused Food, uh, not food, manu uh, but manufacturers of all stripes to actively reduce that particular content or ingredient. So it's it's one of those things, you know, where I mean, it's it's kind of happening everywhere. There may be one day in which Prop 65 will have to be reworded, but this is the law right now. So uh, if we don't do it, other people are doing it. That's essentially my response. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for doing this. I'm very passionate myself about this topic. Can't come soon enough. Um, and sorry that I came in late. Oh, no um, So same, my question is about the same study, and I may, might have missed this. Are we talking specifically about sugar or HFCS, high fructose? Do we know, and will that confound the research and so this was actually uh, uh, encompassed a, a broad range of sweetened beverages, and then they got um, they got a lot. They got soda, they got fruit juice, they got energy drinks and sports drinks, they got sweetened dairy products, which is like chocolate milk. Um, they got all sorts of stuff. It was actually really, really comprehensive, like sweetened artificial, not artificial, like like sugar, added sugar 
uh, beverages. So was it broken down for specifically each of those would cause cancer or just as a group? Because just as a group. It just yeah, seems I don't like I did not recall seeing that. More right. mm -hmm. time and and um, objections from all of the different makers of the different products. Um, yeah, it uh, I believe that it was just a group. But then they did say that the average sugar content uh, was 11 grams uh, uh, per 100 milliliters. Yeah, that was the thank average you. sugar count. Yep, thank you. Okay, well, it seems that this uh, study is ever the hot topic for everyone's question. So mm -hmm. yes, mine is about that too, because um, it says that um, the consumption of artificially sweetened beverages is not associated. So I want to know, and I don't know if this has been looked into yet or if there's a plan to... Um, since obviously it's uh, saying not a difference between artificial sugar or, or regular. I mean, is it also like looking at applying also this warning label to things like natural sweeteners like honey and stevia, maple syrup, coconut sugar? Um, you know, I, I don't recall seeing that particular uh, a question that was in the actual study. Because the, the way the study was designed was that it was a, a food questionnaire asking you uh, on a fairly recent day, what, what exactly did you eat and then how much quantity? I'm not sure if there were check boxes for all the things that you mentioned, uh, but there were che check boxes for, like there were something like 5,000 different types of foods that you could choose from. Mm -hmm. uh, so conceivably, you know, honey, stevia could be in there, but it, it wasn't, as far as I, I know, it wasn't in this particular paper. But the data bank is still there. This is part of a large scale nutritional study and everything is like kept in, in computers. I would imagine if some other researcher want to go back and look at another aspect. So, I mean, do you think there's been any look at that like as far as like link of like honey and cancer is that? Uh, not that I'm aware of, um, but as I've said, I'm not, this is not my day job. <laughs> so <laughs> like I think you know, a lot of people here would understand that a, a lot more and, and know how to go about that. One of the things I love about these conferences is watching the microphone get adjusted as different people of different heights <laughs> come up to the microphone. I'm just saying. Uh, hey, Ben. Um, enjoyed your talk. Uh, Thank you. My question is, um, well, it has to do with uh, kind of current trends in the marketplace. And this could be confirmation bias on my part, but it seems like uh, low calorie drinks like LaCroix and, uh, and like sparkling waters are becoming more and more popular. And, uh, and like people are kind of shifting away from uh, sugary drinks. Um, my question is, I guess it's an invitation to play futurist. Like where do you see um, things being in like two to three years? Do you think there'll be a warning label on uh, sugary drinks? Will they be as, as prevalent? Um, what do you think is gonna happen? Um, I think this is going to be a, a significant multi-year effort. Um, it, it is one of those things where I can see significant pushback from all people of all sorts of stripes. I mean, sugar is everywhere, right? Anybody who's got added sugar in, in products is going to fight, you know, tooth and nail against this uh, proposed regulation. Um, so then there are people like us who might conceivably, you know, push for it. And there's going to be a lot of pushback. Um, I don't think this is going to be maybe not five or even 10 years, it's going to take a while. But then depending on the, the quality of the research and how much research we can get out, and then if the case becomes more convincing, then certainly this could become a reality sooner. Or Proposition 65 might, might have changed, right? might have already changed because of the, um, the, the multiple criticisms of that, about this law. Uh, from a lot of people whose uh, uh, profits are at stake, right? We don't even know whether Prop 65 will stay like this forever. Um, so, you know, I guess I wouldn't, uh, the short answer is I wouldn't hold my breath, <laughs> you know, to see sugar warning labels in everywhere. I think a lot of times, you know, the regulations, even if they do come out, a lot of people will, will avoid that label. For example, for the, the last product, what was the, the one that um, I mentioned? Um, the one with the attorney general suing that particular product uh, is that they decided acrylamide. You know, so they decided to reduce acrylamide levels. You know, to avoid a warning label. Um, so that could conceivably happen to a lot of products. You know, a lot of manufacturers say, okay, well, we're just going to use less sugar. Or we're going to use a substitute or something like that. And it's already happening, right? People are using stevia mixed with cane sugar to reduce the amount of sugar that they're using. So that could entirely be true. Thank you. Right. Thanks.